Hello and welcome to Journal, I'm Steve Kendall. Bowling Green State University has been tapped to lead a national project that deals with research into fresh water and understanding how watersheds work and preventing toxic algal blooms in those waterways. Uh, joining us is the distinguished research professor in biology from Bowling Green State University, Dr. George Bullerjohn. He is also the director of BGSU's Great Lakes Center for Fresh Waters and Human Health. So, uh, Dr. Bullerjohn, welcome to the program today and appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to fill you in on the sorts of things that we're doing here. So, right. thanks for having me. Yeah, and I know that we've talked, and, and this has been an ongoing project. I remember when we first started talking about Lake Erie, and it's been a number of years ago, uh, I know that you and your colleagues that time said, look, the solution is, is not going to happen immediately. This is going to take a lot of time because the issue is built up over a lot of time and there is no flip a switch and we've fixed the problem sort of thing. So uh, here we are talking about this, but talk a little about the Great Lakes Center for Freshwaters Human Health and, and the things that you guys have been doing and what's in the works and, and the fact that you, you've weathered the COVID pandemic pretty well, which is a good thing to know because we don't want to abandon the research on the lake because of that. So talk about what you folks have been up to since the last time we talked. Okay, good. Uh, I'll, I'll start with just talking in, in general about our center. Mm -hmm. uh, our center is funded by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Science Foundation for it's a $5.2 million award, which not only funds work at Bowling Green State University, and my colleagues, uh, 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 Tim Davis here, mm -hmm. uh, but it funds uh, projects with collaborators at seven other institutions. And so we're, uh, the projects are threefold within this uh, center. First, it's um, we look at uh, factors which stimulate or uh, we look at the environmental factors which drive the formation, persistence and decline of cyanobacterial harmful algal bloom events. Uh, the second thing is to try to analyze the toxins which are present and the other kinds of metabolites to see exactly what they all are because we really, hmm. there's a whole suite of toxins we don't know about. So let's discover what's actually these organisms are making. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is a comparison of all the different analytical tools that we have to see what's the best what are the best practices for predicting bloom, bloom events and communicating these, these mm -hmm. uh, problems to the public. Yeah. And so um, my lab specifically uh, deals with the first problem and looking at uh, factors which contribute to the formation and, mm -hmm. and persistence and decline of bloom events. Yeah. Now, um, mm -hmm. specifically for uh, my lab, we're actually looking at those uh, sorts of things which kill off cyanobacterial blooms. Ah. And so you might think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, oh, if we could just come up with a, a biological stressor that would actually wipe out a bloom, that would be a good thing. And, and in fact, it isn't. Uh, oh, and the reason okay. is, it's kind of interesting. The reason is, is that cyanobacterial toxins are kept inside host cells. Hmm. And what we've done, uh, we, we did a project um, in last year and then in 2019, showing that if uh, there are viruses which actually attack the, the algae. Hmm. And when that happens, that actually releases the toxin into the water. Oh. And so that goes straight into the water plant and the water plant actually has dissolved toxin to deal with instead of actually using sand filters to filter out the cells. You can filter out the cells, you get rid of most of the toxin. If, if all the cells are rupturing, well, then you got a problem that you have to deal with the water that enters mm -hmm. the plant. So, so we actually documented an event uh, of a viral attack on the 2019 bloom, which actually saw a really bad spike in dissolved toxins. So, mm -hmm. so we're actually, we're, we're developing tools in which uh, water plant operators can uh, detect viral activity as it's happening, so they'll know in advance that they have to do these uh, these remedial uh, actions on the water that enters the plant. Right. So that's that's one thing we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, another project, uh, and in and this is all, everything's in collaboration with my colleague Tim Davis here mm -hmm. at Bowling Green. Uh, the the other project is looking at uh, factors which stimulate the growth of the Planktothrix bloom in Sandusky Bay, which, is, which right. has really been a problem for, up until last year. 
Hmm. And what's really surprising is that uh, the bloom has been happening every year for 20 years. And then last year, uh, in our COVID year, which despite the fact you're able to get out every week, it never appeared. And it mm, hasn't appeared okay. yet this year either. And so we're trying to figure out why mm -hmm. this is good news, but we don't know the cause of the good news. And so these, right. this is one of mother nature's little surprises. Mm -hmm. um, what we do know that last year, uh, there wasn't a huge load of nutrients into the Bay. It was a little lower than average, but mm -hmm. still pretty, Decent. Yeah, but not enough to uh, account for the complete disappearance of, of the blue. Not enough. Right. right, not enough. Right. And secondly, hmm. uh, but the other thing we noticed is that we, there were a lot of calm days, a lot of bright sunshine. The weather was good for mm -hmm. the most part. And so the, the cyanobacterial bloom there, the planktothrix bloom, doesn't like a lot of light. Ah, and so okay. we had a, a lot of very sunny days very little sediment in the waters that, that would make the water cloudy and turbid, which this, which the organisms like. like. Mm -hmm. And so we think that a light penetration had a lot to do with it. And this is helping inform uh, restoration projects in the Bay in which they're trying to uh, construct islands that would limit wave action and limit sediment resuspension. Uh -huh. So, so we think that's playing mm -hmm. a role, but it might not be, mm -hmm. but like, nature it's probably not the whole story right now this the, the and i this is a total question that you haven't touched on do the yeah. lake levels affect this and if so how i mean because we had higher than normal lake levels That's over the last years this year apparently is going to be a lower lake level year so that you take that into account as well that has that has impact also that it should have impact uh and uh in a shallow embayment such mm -hmm. as sandusky bay will have ah, uh, okay uh, so Sedimentary resuspension actually would ex you would expect to go up under lower um, water conditions because wind driven events they mm -hmm. have to move less water that means moving more sediment yeah. so so that's another uh, factor we have to consider mm -hmm. we have to look at these events year by year over year uh, right. one year isn't going to tell us a story so we we have to compare high water years with low water years. And we haven't been out there long enough to really assess the impacts, but yeah. certainly it does mm -hmm. have an impact. Right, yeah. Um, when we come back, let's talk, obviously you've got a lot of other initiatives that you guys have undertaken and will be undertaking. So uh, we can talk more about the, you know, Bowling Green State University's research into the health of Lake Erie. Back with uh, Dr. George Bullerjean in just a moment here on The Journal. Thank you for staying with us here on The Journal. Our guest is Dr. George Bullerjean, the director of BGSU's Great Lakes Center for Fresh Waters and Human Health. Uh, and, you know, we've talked about Lake Erie, we've talked about Sandusky Bay, uh, but I know that across the country, we're not the only ones experiencing algal blooms or water quality issues somewhat related to that. So uh, talk briefly just a little bit about, about what else is going on around the country a little bit and, and, and that sort of thing, because we're not the only ones dealing with this. We like to think we are because it's so close to us, but it's a national problem. Yes, and uh, these bloom events are expanding and becoming yeah. more common uh, nationwide. We're seeing uh, expansion of bloom events that would typically occur in more you know, warmer regions. We're mm -hmm. seeing them uh, move further north. Uh, there are many different kinds of toxic cyanobacteria uh, that produce different suites of toxins, and we're starting to see them in Ohio from, mm. from uh, uh, latitudes further south. So it really is a, a, a national problem. We see uh, bloom events, there are very serious bloom events in Florida, South Carolina, the, uh, the, water, um, the water supply, just like Toledo, the water supply to uh, Salem, Oregon was shut down uh, hmm. uh, a couple of years back. And uh, the, the different kinds of toxins which are being identified uh, are, uh, we're discovering more and more toxins as time goes on. And so this is a problem that isn't gonna go away. Uh, so we actually do collaborate with folks that are working on lakes that are distinct from Lake Erie, uh, because the more we know about the different kinds of toxic cyanobacteria, uh, the more we can know what to look for if they get here and they start uh, populating Lake Erie. Uh, another, another aspect of this is that if we can figure out how to use the, the latest instrumentation that can document the presence of the blooms and, and look at and examine the toxins, a lot of these instruments have to be put in a lake that's a challenging environment. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so yeah. what we're, one approach we're taking is we're, we're deploying instrumentation into smaller lakes, which are easier to, mm. the, to handle or right. the, where the weather conditions are easier to handle. Uh, so we know how to operate these devices, which cost you know, $30,000. Right. Uh, we'll le learn how to do things in a smaller lake before we deploy them in Lake Erie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one pro we have a number of projects uh, in Chautauqua Lake, New York, which is a four hours away in extreme western New York, has mm -hmm. uh, harmful algal blooms. And uh, we're putting nutrient analyzers uh, in throughout the lake to try to understand how what are the pulses of nutrients which are driving these uh, mm -hmm. the events that we see there right. we're not only are we learning something about chautauqua lake and how to manage that bloom and it's there's a very big economy around that lake mm -hmm. uh we're also learning techniques on how to best you utilize instrumentation in more challenging environments like right. lake Erie. yeah yeah, because you know, we, we look at the lakes and again, we see it as a recreational tourist kind of thing and it seems relatively benign, but yeah, the, the technology that you're putting in there to, to gather this information, it's a pretty abusive environment for it because water levels go up and down, wave action, all sorts of weather, uh, all of those things impact that. So that's, that's and, an interesting and, point, yeah. And let's not forget boat traffic. Well, yeah, uh, oh, uh, whoops, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's, that's mm. proving to be a real challenge and, and ah. In Chautauqua Lake, putting things on buoys uh, actually didn't work well uh, oh. because uh, 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 boats would run into them. So, uh, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, the more we learn about, uh, so anything we learn from one lake can be, uh, mm -hmm. there's information that can be transferred to, to, to others. And mm -hmm. uh, another, another aspect that I think is very important that people are, uh, may not be aware of is that when we talk about toxins, everything around here is centers around microcystin, which is produced by the two big organisms that grow here, microcystis and planktothrix. Well, there are other toxins out there. We're detecting anatoxin, which is a neurotoxin. We're detecting mm -hmm. that uh, at times. Uh, we can detect genes for saxitoxin, which is another neurotoxin, all throughout Ohio and in the central basin of Lake Erie. And so, um, we should uh there's a lot more going on than just microcystin and uh uh some of these blooms uh don't occur on the surface or throughout the water column they actually occur on the bottom uh of lakes and so uh, a lot of a lot of animal poisonings you know uh, dog deaths are associated with these benthic blooms which are these mats that form on the bottom of lakes so we got to be watching out for lots of things that uh we haven't been thinking about as deeply uh, over the years. Yeah, well, and that's a good point because we, the, the average person, like most of us are, who, do, who don't deal with this to the degree that you do, uh, we simply, when we see the algal blooms, we assume that's the, that's the only thing that's going on. But as you said, there's a lot more going on just below the surface than all the way to the bottom of, of whatever uh, particular body of water you're working with. And, and that, that expands the, uh, the scope of what you have to look for. So that's a good point because we, we only see the this, this material that shows up on top. And I guess that's, yeah. that's, that's what worries us the most. But the reality is, uh, as you said, there's such a variety of these things and how they impact, how, they, how, how toxic they are is, is also, also part of this whole research package. Right, and uh, you know, there, there. I mean, there's the the issue is so mm -hmm. complicated. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we're seeing the migration of of different toxic species coming further and further north. That's linked to climate change. Mm -hmm. Climate change is real. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're we're seeing that uh, you know, in this part of the world, uh, climate change is modeled to be, to yield more intense storms and more rainfall, which means more nutrient runoff. Uh, we're certainly seeing in the West, it's contributing to drought. Over here, it's contributing to more more water. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, trying to understand the interplay between climate change and these uh, harmful algal blooms is 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 another issue. Mm -hmm. um, I could go on and on. Uh, sure. uh, another another complicating factor is that uh, when you look at a bloom and it's all green water, it's you you might think it's all this exactly the same organism. Right. Well, there it's it's the same species, but there are, there are different genotypes in there. Some are toxic, some aren't. Mm -hmm. And depending on what time of year it is, 
it may be more toxic or not. So you might see green water and it's not toxic at all or not very toxic. Mm -hmm. You might see water looks okay and it might be very toxic. And so, ah. so uh, these sorts of trying to understand the interplay between toxic and toxic genotypes and factors like other organisms, other bacteria, which may promote the toxicity of, of the bloom. Uh, you know, we're only just now teasing that out and we need mm -hmm. very, very detailed molecular tools in order to sort that out, to identify all the genes in the water and figure out how they're being turned on mm -hmm. and off. Yeah, now we come back, you touched a little bit on, you know, we were talking about the, the viral impact and how uh, some of those uh, source points with like wastewater treatment plants, things like that. We come back and we talk a little bit about, again, and you, and you mentioned it too, the, the runoff and things of that nature and, and how you folks are looking at that and dealing with that and, and being able to measure that in some way too. So we can talk about what's going into the lakes maybe in a, in a, in a way as well. So and, we can, and that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, in terms of, in terms of understanding nutrient loads, mm -hmm. Uh, we uh, we rely on the work of other folks, uh, the, certainly mm -hmm. the, the lab at Heidelberg, uh, led by Laura right. Johnson, the National Center for Water uh, Quality mm -hmm. uh, Research. Uh, they have data sets going back decades on uh, on nutrients, uh, link, you know, nutrients in the major rivers that are under Lake Erie. Yeah, and so uh, we do have a pretty good idea of what kinds of nutrient reductions will be necessary to, to minimize the blooms. There has been a recommendation uh, in the uh, uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement Annex 4 that a 40% reduction phosphorus loads uh, are appropriate. Uh, one of the projects in our center is to actually manipulate bloom biomass with a 40% reduction to see if that actually does wow. anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's work by Hans Pearl at the University of North Carolina. We're, we're collaborating with him as uh, in, within the center. Okay. And uh, uh, that looks like 40% is a reasonable mm. target, but uh, uh, there are some problems with it, but it's let's just say it's, it, it, it's reasonable, mm -hmm. okay? The big problem, though, is getting to getting uh, to that forty percent reduction. Yeah. We know that years where the nutrient load is about down forty percent due to a low rain year, we don't have much of a bloom, and so that that sort of drove the, the initial decision. Now, how we actually permanently change land use such that that forty percent reduction is achieved is really tough. I mean, there are land use models which come close. Uh, land use scenarios that have been developed at, at Ohio State and University of Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, doing it through voluntary measures uh, is will take us part of the way there. But I think mm -hmm. the my opinion, mm -hmm. and it's just my opinion, is that we're going to uh, down the road we may need uh, uh, some regulations yeah. imposed to to, to get to right. that get yeah. to that target. Well, when, when we come back, let's talk a little more about that, and then any other initiatives that we that we haven't talked about that you believe are important too, and we can we can kind of well, a, as we know, this is not a story that ends in the next seven or eight minutes, right. but uh, right. we can we can touch base on that. So back in just a moment with Dr. George Bullerjohn, the director of BGSU's Great Lakes Center for Fresh Waters and Human Health, here on the Journal. You're with us here on The Journal. Our guest is Dr. George Bullerjohn, the director of BGSU's Great Lakes Center for Fresh Waters and Human Health. Uh, at the end of that last segment, you were talking about the fact that you do have a model, at least, uh, that, that seems to say that a 40% reduction would be an appropriate goal, a reasonable goal, to maybe affect the changes that we believe we would like to see in, in the Lake Erie quality environment. Uh, and there are various, the state of Ohio has the H2O initiative, that sort of thing. Uh, but you did say, and again, uh, an opinion that volunteer measures probably won't get us to that 40%. Uh, maybe talk a little about that, and again, how the state's efforts with H2O and, and the other things they've talked about have at least kind of leaned, it pointed us in the right direction, maybe. Yeah, it, I mean, the politically, mm -hmm. I think uh, H2O Ohio is, is, is a, is a great thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's done a lot of, uh, it, there's a lot of good in it. It's, mm -hmm. it's a tremendous effort. I think the, the governor, governor needs a lot of credit for, for pushing this through. Uh, I, I'm hoping that the, the full 10 year effort can be seen through in, in, in upcoming budgets. And 
Uh, there's a lot of good in it. Uh, 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 there are economic incentives for farmers to to do the right thing and 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 uh, and develop a nutrient management plan. Right now, there's a forty dollar an acre uh, uh, incentive. If the farmers sign up for, I think, a three-year period to develop a nutrient management plan, they, they get the 40 bucks an acre. Yeah. So I think that's that's farmers are signing up for that. That will have an impact. Uh, yeah. There are, uh, you know, will measures like this get to the 40% reduction? I I honestly don't know. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. the the modeling suggests it'll get closer, but will it get there? Uh, it it, it mm -hmm. may take. Uh, more serious efforts, and so uh, I, I think uh, the the way the political climate is right now, uh, adding a adding a tax on farmers isn't going to work. I mean, uh, uh, and but let's see what we can do for now with H two Ohio, and then if if more serious measures are required, we have to think about that in the future. So, yeah. and, and, uh, and oh, sorry, and you mentioned the political part of it, and I guess. Because what you hear, again, and we obviously you know, talk to, I don't talk to everybody, but when this topic comes up, generally speaking, people say, well, it's, there's, there's, there's two arguments going on. There's two sides to this. And one side says, well, once you clean up all the wastewater treatment plants, come and see me about my 500 acres of farmland. And now yeah. we know that both are contributors, but that's, and the other side says, well, when you clean up all the agricultural land, uh, you know, we're doing the best we can with our water treatment. Um, so that, that's kind of this linchpin on this whole thing is one side sees the other side as the greater contributor, the other side sees it exactly the opposite way. And there's more than, more than two sides, obviously, but that always seems what it kind of drills back down to. So the incentive for agricultural land, which makes up most of the watershed of the Maumee River Basin, uh, how, do, how, do, how do, and I know I'm asking you a question, but these things will at least try and incent that part of the contributing yeah. group to to make it better. I right. Guess. Well, I uh, I think people need to understand that most of the nutrients are coming from agriculture. Okay. All right. These days, uh, and not everybody knows that or accepts it, but mm -hmm. that's the that's reality. the truth. That's the reality. Okay. All in, right. in the in the earlier days when Lake Erie was cons was uh, declared mm -hmm. dead. Uh, point sources, uh, industrial wastewater treatment, that was that was the major source. Ah. That was uh, so they played a bigger role. Mm -hmm. um, so the the game has shifted and we just have to realize that that's what the game is that's now. That's what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another so there there another issue uh, that you know and I, I think there's some disagreement among the scientists as to how serious it is. But I, I would really like to see a better assessment of uh, animal feeding operations. Ah, you know, okay. Animal feeding operations are regulated over um, a thousand animals of a thousand pounds each. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, <laughs> so however you weigh that out is mm -hmm. what your animal your your concentrated animal feeding operation is. If you're below that, you're not regulated. So ah. uh, it's if I were if I had animals, I'd try to keep below that yeah. level to be in, uh, to be free of regulation. Right. And so, uh, you know, in the past, uh, uh, manure could be applied up to 100, 150 ppm uh, mm -hmm. in the soil, whereas for row crops, it's 50. And so they were getting they could apply more phosphorus to the soil. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's changing. But uh, really, what's the impact? We know there are more animal feeding operations uh, in the region than there were 15 mm -hmm. years ago. So I, I think that's uh, that's an area which requires a little more investigation to see what the contribution is. Right. Uh, yeah. I think there's some disagreement that it's a big one, or a, I think mm -hmm. there's some disagreement as to how big it is. But I, I think it's, it's worth worth it, looking. Yeah, at. It's, it's 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 a potential contributor. We just don't know how much, but it, it would seem. You, yeah, it would seem that if you think about it logically, it has to be a contributor. The question is, yeah, how much? And and, and you're right, more people will will get into that and stay under the regulatory limit, uh, which I don't know if that was based on a scientific, uh, you yeah, know, discussion I, or let's just say a thousand. That sounds like a good number. I don't know. That's, pre, that yeah. all that pre. Yeah, I had yeah. nothing to do. Sure. Yeah, that. predates, predates me, and I. That's the way yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So. Uh, 
Yeah, we, we've got just a couple of minutes. Is there one thing, one area that you guys would really want people to know that you're focusing on right now or the, or the thing well, you see I, as the next, next big step for you? You know, I, I guess I want to leave with a sort of a more positive thing. Mm -hmm. and sure. There are farmers signing up mm -hmm. for uh, these incentives. There are farmers that want to do the right thing. We have the the Blanchard Demonstration Farms Network, which is uh, you know in which is educating farmers on best practices. Uh, and there is you know I'm old enough to remember when Lake Erie was a dead lake sure. uh, you know, back mm -hmm. and uh, not maybe not everybody is, but uh, oh yeah. But I think there's a sense, and when I work with people and I talk to people in the field, and I uh, you know there is the sense that hey, we did it before, we can do it again. Mm -hmm. And and so there is a there's an underlying sense of optimism to throughout the field, which gives me hope. I mean, there are some areas of the United States where they're plagued with blooms, they've never seen it before. It's a panic mode for them and they don't know what to do. Sure. Well, we've done this, we know what the source is, uh, we understand these blooms, we know what to look for. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand these blooms better. We, you know, we, yeah. If we understood them all, we wouldn't have a problem. Right. But we, we, we do know what the source is, and, and we do have an idea of what the targets are. Yeah. And so it's going to take time, but mm -hmm. we've done it before. Yeah, and, yeah and, and as you said, we're, we're aware now. We've gathered more information, so we know, we know it's doable. We just have to figure out how to get to that point. And, and, and yeah. everybody is aware that it's an issue that, that needs to be addressed. And so that's, that's the first step, is, is understanding that you have a problem. And that's, yeah. we're, we're at that point, and we know that we've felt, dealt with this before, as you said, and got the lake back to uh, good shape. And so we know it's, it's, a po it's possible to do it. So that's good. Well, uh, yeah. Dr. George Bullerjean, uh, Director of BGSU's Great Lakes Center for Fresh Waters and Human Health, thank you so much for being on. Uh, we'll have you and your colleagues on uh, in the future to talk about how this is progressing and, and the steps we're taking and uh, yeah, and the positive moves toward making Lake Erie a better lake and all, all the waterways that, that feed into that and, and through Ohio. So appreciate it very much. Well, my Thanks. pleasure and I hope to be in the studio next time. Yeah, we, so. we'll, we'll be glad to have you and we're, we're getting back to that. Yeah, we're, yeah, in fact, uh, I know you ask about that, but yeah, we'll be getting people in here and we can, it's, yeah, we can have that conversation. So it'll be good, okay. it'll be good. Terrific. Yep. Terrific. You can check Thanks. us out each week at WBGU.org. And of course, you can watch us uh, every week on WBGU PBS. See you next time on The Journal.